Thank you, Mr. Rhodes, for taking your time out of day to Let's meet with me. Let's get started. Okay. What originally brought you to South Africa, being a son of a wealthy British man? Well, Xavier... It's Xander. Well, Xander, my apologies. You know, two of my brothers were at college, and then I was stuck home with health issues. What were those health Instead issues? of attending university, I was sent to South Africa in 1870 to work on a cotton farm. So, cotton farm? How did you first get into the diamond business, then? Well... Honestly, I could not stand trying to grow cotton anymore, and the diamond fever just overcame me, so I had this determination to become wealthy, like my father. Interesting. So where did you first start in the diamond business? Well, in 1871, we moved to Kimberley, the center of mining in those years. At first, however, the mining was worse than working on the cotton farms. What made you and your brother stay? My brother, Herbert, the impatient man he was, left after two years... I still went to Kimberley on and off for years. Where else were you? Um, at Oxford. And why do you think you had so much influence there at Oxford? Five simple things. My age, my background, my charm, my good looks, and of course, my philosophy of imperialism. We'll be right back to hear about Cecil Rhodes' political life in Africa after the break. <laughs> Come buy our diamonds, fresh off the mines in Kimberley, South Africa. On sale for £100 per carat, while you can meet and greet the great Cecil Rhodes at the campus of his alma mater, Oxford University. The Kimberley miners are first class and we treat these African miners exceptionally well. So once again, come to Oxford University tomorrow to pick up your diamonds from Kimberley Mines. And remember, remember a diamond, diamond is forever. Is forever. How did your success in diamonds and gold relate to imperialism? Well, by last year, I owned 90% of the world's diamond production and formed the Goldfields of South Africa company. Both of my major companies were allowed to finance schemes of nor northward expansion because of the terms in the Articles of Association. Would you now, let's talk about your political involvement in Africa. What earned you the respect that you were given? Painting the map red. Again, my genius. And at that point, mystical philosophy of imperialism made me the most attractive man in South Africa in all areas. Why do you advocate for British expansion in Africa, not considering the consequences for the natives? Well, Xander, I thought that it was our duty to seize every opportunity of acquiring more territory. The more territory simply means that more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best, most human, most honorable race the world possesses. There were obstacles, however. In your effort for imperialism, competition with other nations was the largest obstacle to overcome, right? Yes. Let us talk about the Paul Kruger story. I would rather not. Why not? Aren't you ultimately successful? No, my blood pressure rises when I speak of Paul Kruger. Uh, always a jokester. Uh, when did you first meet Paul? Must have been in 1885. There was a conference. There was a conference to negotiate African territories. And what was the agreement? Agreement? He was too stubborn to even listen to my compromise. We forced him to give up the protectorate in Gosen. What did he receive? Nothing. And what was the next time you had an encounter with Kruger? While I was trying to imperialize, help my country, the most superior nation in the world, Kruger stood in my way. Please elaborate. Well, you know, with this policy of Africa for the Afrikaners, which were the Boers. So how did you overcome Kruger? He was too greedy, and that is what led to his downfall. How so? He tried to control Matabeland. The king of Matabeland knew that once he left white men in, there was no turning back. But why did he trust you then? The only white men he trusted were missionaries. I got my friend, John Moffat, a son of a missionary, to instill trust in the, on the king. By 1889, we started building a territory in Manabaland through my persuasion of the king. So this made you popular throughout Britain? Yes. But what about Queen Victoria? Did she find you attractive despite the accusations that you were a woman hater? Woman hater? How could I dislike a sex to which your majesty belongs? Queen Victoria adores me. Oh gosh, Mr. Rhodes, we are running a little bit over time. Anyway, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to meet with me. Any last words of advice to the viewers? Remember that you are an Englishman, and have consequently won first prize in the lottery of life. Cecil, we live in America, but thank you very much once again. <laughs>
So after a hundred years of examination, it's easy to see the consequences of Cecil Rhodes' actions for both Britain and the natives. While Rhodes expanded Britain's power, he disregarded the rights of the African natives. His treaties with the various African chiefs were usually vague and one-sided. As a result, this allowed the British to expand in Africa more easily without the consent of the natives. Also, some of the laws passed while Rhodes was Prime Minister of the Cape laid the foundation for the apartheid policies in South Africa during the 20th century. These policies were similar to the Jim Crow laws that were passed in the United States at the time. The question is if Rhodes' actions and beliefs are justifiable and acceptable considering both perspectives and the time period. Now let's head back to Rachel and the crew to learn more about imperialism in South Africa.